Hi, my name is Sylvia Medina, and I'm really happy to be here on to celebrate World Rainforest Day with you, 2022. So um, I was asked to see if I can give you guys just to give you a presentation about what Green Kids Club book, what Green Kids Club does, and you know, many of you might not be familiar with our brand and how we're trying to make a difference with environmental education for children. So let me go to the first um, slide and just explain to you who I am. And then, of course, you know, if you have any questions later on, you can send them in. And hopefully this presentation will give you some information as to what we are trying to accomplish. Okay, so uh, this is Sylvia. That's me. I'm with a little baby elephant named Molelo, who I'm really excited. I was really excited to be feeding with Elephants Without Borders. You'll hear a little bit about them. And these are some grizzly bears in Teton National Park that I... Uh, took some photos of many years ago. I didn't take this photo, although um, a famous photographer named Thomas Mangelson did. We've done some books with them, and there's Monello, the little fire elephant that I'll tell you about. I'm originally from Arizona. I now live in Idaho, uh, close to Yellowstone uh, National Park, which is uh, <sighs> undergoing flooding right now, probably due to global warming and all the different things that are going on in our world today. Um, also, I'm a mother. I have twins, a little boy and a little girl. Well, actually, they're teenagers right now, and a young boy named Tiago, and mother of three dogs, two cats, three birds. I've been a mother of all sorts of animals, though, in the past. Dogs, cats, like I said before, cows, turkeys. Uh, it's been fun. I founded the Snake River Animal Shelter here in Idaho Falls, Idaho, where we were trying to save animals from being euthanized. There were about 10,000 animals being euthanized a year. And I came in and was hoping to make a difference and um, built an animal shelter with a lot of help. But, and I also owned a business called Northwind and I sold that business about 2011 and started writing children's books, um, which I'll be telling you about and how we integrate some um, rainforest themes into our, our books. Um, and I also started a foundation called Love the Wild where we donate books for children to help make a difference. Okay, so here's just kind of a little, just a little video about us. So that's um, kind of who we are, just really quick, uh, just a summary. It also includes some of the animation that we've been doing, or we're hoping to do. So um, so what is a Green Kids Club and what do we do? Okay, well, we try to spread, we are, we think, spreading the word about environmental issues relating to people and animals through storytelling. Um, our, and some of, you know, as I mentioned, rainforest habitats are also a big part of our stories. And um, as you can see, you'll see this as we're going through the presentation. We work with conservation groups like Elephants Without Borders, Saving the Survivor, Blood, Lion, Blood Lions, Orangutan Republic, Save Elephant Foundation, the Cougar Fund, uh, many, many other groups we're working with all over the world and in the country. And what we do is we write children's books with, these, with them in collaboration with them, and sometimes we actually co-author a book with them. Um, we take a theme that's related to their conservation, and of course, it's all environmental conservation oriented. And we write a story relating to an animal that they might be working with, endangered species normally, um, and, and also, you know, issues related to the environment and habitats. And then we also have at the end of the story, 
we have a science section which talks about them as a you know what they've done and also the animal itself and I think it's a really working very well and I'll show you some of the things that we're doing this and also part of this um, after we publish a book with the organization we'll donate a couple hundred copies to the group and then they can go ahead and give them to other children throughout the world or wherever they they're they're based out of we've been giving books out of Kruger National Park with some of the books with out in Botswana and Belize and various various other places um, and as I mentioned, we, we give away books. We also do some classroom experiences. We have something called um, where we do, you know, an online class to teach children about a certain animal. Right now we have one on Grizzly 399 and it's based, it is on our homepage, which is www.greenkidsclub.com. Um, and like, as you can see from the pictures here, we uh, donate books to classrooms. We get calls from a number of classrooms and say, hey, you know, We'd like you to give some books to our kids and also maybe do a Zoom reading or can you show up? And in some cases, if it's in our area, I'll show up and read a story to them. Here we're reading a story about, we gave books to about Grizzly 399 and here a foundation out of Miami. And, you know, and in some cases I'm actually in different places of the world and I'll give a presentation and give some books out. So. So I want to tell you about our Environmental Hero series. So that's mainly based on what I've been telling you about. Um, like I said, we take stories about animals and their survival, and we take the children to hopefully to this place in the world so that they can experience it and see what, you know, what's happening. And um, some of the issues are a little bit, I guess they can be frightening, but we've done the best we can to make sure that they are, the kids learn and, you know, you know versus being afraid of something and so so you'll see what i'm talking about okay so here are the books that we've written to date right now um we've written like there's three books on grizzly 399 and i'll tell you a little bit about her uh, we just completed a book about a bee in africa ellie the shining star cabello a silly little rhino molelo the fire elephant and these other books here at the bottom and we do have one on Forest rainforest issues related to Princess the orangutan based out of uh, Borneo or Indonesia. Okay. So, um, you know, I was asked to, to tell you guys, well, what do we do and how do we do it? And you might have some interest in, in it. Um, so we have a book called, well, actually, there's a an animal, a true grizzly bear based out of uh, Teton National Park here in the United States in the state of Wyoming. Um, the bear is called 399 because that's what the Park Service call, call, you know, that's how they designate her, designated her as. And it's just her life story because she's um, actually an iconic grizzly bear. She's 26 years old now and she's had about 20 cubs. And last year or year before she had four cubs, which was completely amazing. And I'm gonna go into this and see the, uh, the the art is done by Morgan um, Spicer, who's just an amazing artist. And we do have two artists online who help and work with us. And they're also environmental uh, conservationists who love, you know, the stories we're writing. So you can see that in the illustrations. And as you can see, we're partnered with the Cougar Fund, which I'll tell you about here. So what I do is I find a topic that I think will be really interesting. And in this case, I looked at Grizzly 399 because I live in the area and I I love grizzly bears and that's how I became, I went from being an environmental engineer and doing that on a daily basis to actually becoming an environmental conservationist or activist is what I see myself as and as an author. Um, and grizzly bears at the time when I moved to this area, there were only 300 grizzlies in the whole Yellowstone ecosystem and the Endangered Species Act got you know, brought back and now there's over 800 grizzly bears. So I would say that the Endangered Species Act has been very, very successful and hopefully we can continue doing that with other animals, not just here and other places. So here, what I did was I partnered with Thomas D. Mangelson, who's a world-renowned wildlife photographer. You can see his photo there. He loves animals so much and he especially loves grizzly bears. Grizzly 399 is a bear that, um, is iconic to him and to all of us in this area and so so the book talks about her and it talks about 
you know, here you have a science section and we have beautiful photos in the back of the book that you will see. And he gives to the cougar fund, which also gives to other mammals or animals like grizzly bears. So we thank Thomas Mangelson for being the Jane Goodall of grizzly bears for us. Then we did another book and we just thought we would do it because I live in the area and this one was more of a cute book about hibernation, teaching the children the, you know, what, what do animals do when they hibernate? You know, here in the Northwest, it snows, it's cold, the animals go to sleep. And it was just a fun story of five animals or grizzly bears being stuck together in a cave. And it was, um, as you could well imagine, that would be very very uh, challenging for anybody. And if you had your kids in there, that would be even more interesting. If as an, a human, we'd be doing that. So it's a really cute book. Um, then we did one more. Well, here's here's just some just a picture. There's Thomas again, and then the, the bears all sleeping together after they've settled in. And there she is in real life, going to take her cubs to be um, going to hibernation. And you know what's interesting is. She's now, her, her cubs are now, she has moved them on. But, and we did a last book because last year in this area, what happened was she is a grizzly bear. You know, she had so many bears, babies to feed that she started taking them into the town of Jackson, Wyoming, which is not good. Um, she physically took them in there, but fortunately it was at night. And so nobody encountered five huge grizzly bears because at the time the baby grizzlies were about a couple hundred pounds. Um, and they can be rather dangerous if not careful. So the problem with um, what's happened is the bears went into areas where people have left food out. Um, and if you look at this picture where somebody's taking a selfie, um, that kind of stuff was happening. Bears were walking by people. Um, people left, you know, beehives out. They left, you know, seed out. So the bears um, ended up, you know, just becoming habituated. And that can happen with any type of animal, not just bears. So the so our book, our plan was to teach children at the end of the book, don't do this. Teach your parents not to do this, these things. And um, so hopefully we get the message out. And here she is with all of her cubs. You can't see the last one, but it's really beautiful. So um, the next, next book we did was, well, actually it's interesting because we actually did this book first. We did Molelo the Fire Elephant, and I came up with the environmental heroes concept when I met with Elephants Without Borders, who I thank, you know, Michael Chase and Kelly Landon for essentially adopting us to look at, you know, work with them and look at the situations that they're encountering with elephants. And um, I was invited to camp out in Botswana, out of their field camp. And when I arrived, there was a baby elephant that had been actually undergone went through a, um, a fire situation. And um, the baby elephant, what happened was poachers started a fire and you look again at the ecosystem, you know that there's a lot of drought activity that's happened now. And because some of these areas in the Okavango Delta, it's it's beautiful, but it's it can get dry. But poachers started a fire and um, baby elephant got left behind and he was burned. And so I happened to be at the camp and I was very fortunate to be able to help them with the baby elephant and learn about what they do. And so this was kind of the beginning of writing these books. I thought, well, what if we write the story about this baby elephant? And um, what if we write the story of how they helped him and how he went to their orphanage and put that in the book? So I, we did that. We wrote the story, you know, had some a great editing as well. And, you know, we... Uh, um, you know, we wrote the story and then we decided to put a science section in the back. And this book has went out to hundreds and hundreds of people and many children through the Kasani, Botswana area and just all over the world. And it's partnered with Elephants Without Borders. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of us doing these books. Um, and then Ellie and the Shining Star was just a, a thought I had when I was out walking one day. I just was thinking of, I had, was, I was able to go to a place called Wange National Park up in Zimbabwe and I saw that there were all these water holes that were made by man and the elephants and different animals were going to this region to drink water. And I was wondering how good was that to be able to 
have water brought in from man and change the migration patterns of animals to go to these water holes. Um, so we don't really address it in the book, but I thought about adding that as a science section. But this is just about Ellie, who's a baby little elephant who is just very tenacious in how she um, goes with her friends. She meets all these friends on the way trying to find a water hole. And her mom, somehow their moms all get lost. But at the end, it all comes together. And we decided, you know, we've been working with Elephants Without Borders. borders. Let's give them get let's give them some of our proceeds from the book so that's what we're doing so here's just some of the, the you know the illustrations we've done i think they're phenomenal and um, i'm really happy with morgan's work and i do believe that we may be ending up with a uh, animation out of this and we are getting quite a few licenses and we do give part of our proceeds to all the organizations we give we work with anywhere from 30 to 100 percent is what we give So um, here is um, one more book with Elephants Without Borders. We decided to do this. It's a learning book about how the people and children in the Kasani, Botswana area or in Africa, how you learn to live with elephants. Because, you know, I actually got to go to um, Kasani and we did a walk and you'll see a picture of that here shortly. But there were elephants walking right next door to us. And I was um, kind of like, Oh my gosh, look at that. There's elephants, you know, everywhere. And it was um, a little, could be a little bit, it could be a little bit, you know, just not frightening so much as intimidating. And so this book is written to do that. And as a result of that, we're also going to be doing a book learning about grizzlies and other animals that, you know, we've been working in, with. So this is just the area. This is Michael Chase. He's a founder, one of the founders of Elephants Without Borders, along with Kelly Landon. And we did one more on elephants and bee, and actually um, human um, human animal conflict issues. And so one of the um, projects that they worked on was what can keep you know gri or grizzlies keep elephants out of the areas where farmers work. And they determined that bees are a source of you know elephants don't like bees, so they stay away from it. So they are working on you know this you know. Um, bringing this into the community and it's being very successful. So this book covers that. Now, and so this is them, this is Elephants on Borders, Great Elephant Census, some of the different things that they've accomplished. They've counted every elephant in all of Africa a few years ago and they're in some documentaries and just done a magnificent job. And here we are, this is where um, we're walking through the area with children, and it was a three mile walk and there was elephants right next to us. So, so here's a, a, another book that we did, Cabello, A Silly Little Rhino. We partnered with Saving the Survivor. Um, he's a veterinarian named Dr. Johan Marias, and he has done phenomenal work in terms of taking care of animals that have been poached and are still alive. Um, he works all over, all over Africa. So um, this book is about a little Rhino that um, actually he helped save. And so here's Cabello and he's going to some of the beautiful art that we've done, that's just been done, there he is. And the book also was created to support the Rhino Orphanage because because once a um, Rhino is, you know, they've actually saved the Rhino, they um, have to take it, their babies to an orphanage if there's, if, if there's a baby. Then Little Moyo, that's one more book we did with Saving the Survivor. And um, it's, a, it's a story about a different rhino that encountered a different experience. And at the end, he was saved in his relationship with different animals. And so the books are written so that, you know, children can really learn about think, uh, people like poachers. What's a poacher without children being scared? You know, um, I think it's really important that children can understand that. I think sometimes, especially here in the United States, it might be, I might be wrong, but my impression is that, um, we sometimes try to keep children from learning some of the hard things that happen in this world. And our books, I think, approach this very well in terms of this is what happens and, you know, you can make a difference. So there's Dr. Marias right there. So he was, he's one of our partners. And um, here's just a, a, a slideshow showing what they do. 
different activities. You can't see this back here because I'm here. <laughs> Kids receiving the book and them trying to save a rhino. And actually, this picture here is rather graphic anyways. It's of a rhino that got his his whole um, horn cut off. And the rhino's name was Hope. And Hope saved, lived for a number of years. But it's just hard to keep an animal alive after they've undergone so much trauma and just abuse by people. So uh, great work, Dr. Johan. Dr. Johan. And the rhino orphanage, I think they have about 35 baby rhinos right now. And they they do a magnificent job. Here they are working and they have cabello still there. Okay. Then a tale of three lions. And I have done some books outside of Africa. So I'm just bringing up the stories that we've done and let you know what else we'll be doing. A tale of three lions. Um, this is, uh, we work with a group called Blood Lions. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of them. But they um, are a pretty amazing group of people uh it's uh, run by it was actually and there's ian right there ian mitchler in the corner um ian is someone who um who has made a huge difference in terms of bringing the issue forward essentially what the what the what happens in south africa is that people farm lions believe it or not they 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 go and breed lions until you have all these lions that are live are around and the baby lions, what they do with the baby lions, they um, have what they look like petting zoos and people go in there, they're like petting sanctuaries. People go in there thinking that they're making a difference and saving these baby animals, where in reality, what happens is when the baby lion grows up, it's habituated, there's nothing anybody can do with it, and they go in and they do a canned hunt and they kill them. And so what you do is when you go to South Africa and you go to do a tourist activity, like here in these pictures, I'm petting an animal, I'm helping to raise money for a sanctuary. You think you're doing a great thing, but in reality, all you're doing is perpetuating the problem. And so look at the baby lions here, and see in a while there were 33,000, and now look at how many are in captivity. So eight to 10,000. And then here's the essentially life cycle of a canned lion. So this is what happens. People end up, they put the lions here, people pay to get a trophy hunt and they kill a lion that can't run or do anything so that's what this is about um, blood lions has done a phenomenal job of bringing legislation forward to the prime minister the prime minister is looking at making some changes i'm not sure where that's at but the problem that's also being seen is that um this this is going underground and going to other countries now so anyways the book is written it was hard to write so my point is that we can take some really hard issues and make them into a book that I think works well. Thank you, Ian, for your hard work. Now here's a orangutan, a book on princess. And this was also actually my second book I wrote. Um, and I made, a, I, I made a relationship with uh, Gary, Dr. Gary Shapiro, who's from the orangutan Republic Foundation based out of um, or, uh, Indonesia and also LA, Los Angeles. And this is a story of a of an orangutan that, um, and again with beautiful pictures by Morgan Spicer, or illustrations. Uh, he, um, when he was younger, there there Gary is a little younger. Um, he um, he helped save an orangutan that lost her home due to deforestation, so that of course palm oil companies can grow palms and, you know, just ravaged their their habitat and so he found he found her and befriended her and he taught her how to sign language and i think he taught her like 50 or 60 words and it was really a great relationship he had but in the meantime what well, in the book tells a story of when he was um working with her he'd take her out into the rainforest in borneo and you know she'd meet other orangutans and she'd have this huge desire he saw where she wanted to stay there and at the end of the story you'll see that she does um so it does bring up the issues the back of the book talks about orangutan habitat degradation issues and the and and um rainforest and the importance of rainforest for these animals so well, thank you gary for all of your work as well um so i'm just going to go into something here we did we do also work with um 
we take our books and we we look at everyone who care I mean listen to our stories and um, or read our stories and you know children who have dyslexia or just have a hard time reading we have um, we're working with another partner named Noah Tex to write books that show you know actually can show how what it's like I mean show the Noah Tex um, verbiage and children can actually do a great job reading so we are also doing that as well so um, another set of books that we did minus our uh, environmental heroes books which we're working on regularly regularly are classic books and our classic books we those are the ones I told you that we first started with green kids learning to they were able they drink water from a magic spring it gave them the uh, power to talk to animals and so um, so these were just stories made up and they were actually made up with my children because at the time I was you know running the business and I lived close to Yellowstone National Park and I just really wanted to make a difference and so I started writing these stories not knowing much about writing books or illustrations or editing or anything and I'm still learning to be honest with you so we did take our classic books and we've decided to we didn't do that well in our sales we moved on and have decided to revive revive our books with a new artist. His name is um, Andreas Wessel Thurhorn, and he's a former Disney artist. And you'll see you'll see this. And we have diversity in our books and inclusion. And I think you'll really like what you see. So this is the Jade Elephant. We redid that, and I think you could see the touch of you know who he who he used to work for. You know Disney, and his his art is just fabulous and it's fantastic. And this book is mainly about elephants that have been undergone um, who are in captivity in India and loss of habitat so that's what that book's about and this is about a gorillas and issues in gorillas with um, and of course they live in rainforests and what happens with poaching and so the, his art is fabulous so as I mentioned uh, we redid the jade elephant and um, as you can see, we have team with a woman called, called um, Lek Chilart, and she is just phenomenal. I just actually got back from Thailand, and I went by myself the first time I've ever traveled internationally alone with no one, and I got to Thailand. I was able to get there, um, and I was just, just so astonished at what she's accomplished. But this book is, we have dedicated this book to Save Elephant Foundation, and we're, hope, and we're giving part of our proceeds to them and we will be writing another book with her about one of her elephants that she saved from begging on the streets and I'll let me tell you show you the next slide here so um, so this is I just wanted you to see this um, this these slides here about what Save the Elephant Foundation does for a few minutes as you can see it's all jungle area it's in Thailand upper area of Chiang Mai um, it was very hot, very humid, rained like crazy in the afternoons, um, downpour. So it's major rainland, rainforest. And I also have been fortunate enough to go to um, Costa Rica, where there's a lot of monkeys and all sorts of animals in the forest. What was sad about this area is it was a beautiful area, and it's on the border of um, Myanmar and just some other places there. But... But what's sad is that there's no animals, very few animals in the forest. There's no monkeys, or there's very few because people are eating them. Um, and there's no wild ele Asian elephants. Asian elephants are taken into captivity in Thailand. I think I think the number is like 95% or something are in captivity. And these are some photos, the, some photos I have. As you can see, you can see the chains here of an Asian elephant, a bull. And he sits, he stands there all day, all day. He doesn't go anywhere. Uh, and, and during COVID, the animal, before COVID, they used to give rides. I mean, they used to bring, and here's a, a, a you know, there's chains on this elephant here too. Um, but they gave rides to like, oh, I think 500 people a day. And they get very few, you know, 10, I don't know, or maybe 100, 200 people. But regardless, it was like 15 minute rides that would go all day and they would get very little rest. And what happens is the people from that area actually rent the animals out to these riding farms 
and you know and they're trying to change that but people are still out doing the tourist thing and in order to get a baby elephant or an elephant to succumb to humans they have to go through what's called a crush box and the crush box is just a brutal way of getting a baby elephant to do to become essentially a person belong to a person and make the person their master they're afraid of people by the brutality that's been done. And if you get a chance, look at a movie called Love and Bananas or look up a crush box because you will see what happens when to get a baby elephant to become subservient to man. So anyways, these elephants are tied or they're, they're chained their entire life, starting at the age of like five months old after they've undergone the crush box. And, and they can live up to 70 years and can you imagine being where you are chained for your whole life and in a small area with little water? That's the life of these elephants. So what's happened is Lech Chilart and Save Elephant Foundation are going in and they're trying to buy and purchase as many elephants from these groups as they can. But people don't want to let them go. And in some cases, it's just a hard thing to do. But She's managed to save 114 elephants. She's got many areas that's, that's at that particular um, particular um, sanctuary. And she's got sanctuaries all over different countries. So if you were able to Google Save the Elephant Foundation, you'll see that. But this elephant here is just a recent photo of this one just sitting there. This one is an example of what you can be doing if you're riding an elephant. So they have them sitting there, standing there all day, her. This, and so these are examples of two elephants that are still in captivity. And these are some elephants that she saved. This one, um, just brutality in terms of riding, it can no longer, it's, it's knees not good. So they actually were able to get somebody to make a knee brace that they're teaching it. This one, a mine, hit the elephant's foot. Um, and there's just many, many, many other animals. And here, here the animals are free. They're coming down the river. And here, Lek is right here, and the elephants love her. And um, the, you see them around her because these animals have been really taught. I mean, you know, in the past, they were like understood people, you know, and they're around people. And so they're they're very safe for Lek to be around, but they love her because she has saved them. And so I just got back from there, and I was just totally floored, to be honest with you. And they also have over 2,000 cats, over 600 dogs, rabbits that have been undergone medical testing, monkeys, and so many other animals there. It's just amazing what she's accomplished and still doing. So here's an example of Gorilla's Roar, the book that we're redrawing. And these are just some of the images that we've gotten here. So you can see how beautiful the images are. And of course, the rainforest habitat of the gorillas. And, um, and then here it's, you can see, you know, he, as an artist, he really tried to show how the rainforest shows up. But, you know, there's mountain gorillas in Uganda, Rwanda, and the Congo. I was able to go to Uganda, Rwanda. There's gorilla trekking. This little girl is actually in her book. Um, the people in the area are very poor, a huge rainforest area. When I got there, it was completely just rain everywhere. Um, Ebola is a problem there. So this is just some images from the trip. And mountain gorillas, they're the closest, you know, they're are one of the cl human's closest relatives. They share 98% of our DNA, if you can believe that. And um, there's only about 800 gorillas, gorillas left in the world, but the numbers have gone up, so that's a good thing. So here's the habitats that they live in. Major rainforest area. So we have to continue protecting the rainforest. Police trash monster, we did this with... Um, a group out of the Island Academy based out of Belize, amazing artist, um, Walter Castillo, Lady Dixie Bowen, who's just amazing with her. And, and, and what we're trying to do is teach children to just take care of our world and pick up the trash and teach their parents not to throw trash. Um, a lot of the, the uh, areas where there are beaches and stuff have a lot of trash. So at the end of our books have some of these figures and pictures on what you could do. And we've won a number of awards for our books. These are some of our older books, of course, and then these are the newer books. So what's next? Um, 
as you can see, the way we is, we do things is we establish relationships with groups that I work very hard to make sure that they're credible groups, that they do work the right way, and that they're groups that we know where the money's going to, what they're doing. And so all the groups that I presented to you today are groups that we're working with. Um, actually, the Gorilla book right now, we are looking for somebody to work with on that book. So I'm in the process of trying to find a partner there, but I'm not sure if we're going to do partnerships with those books in particular. We may just write them and then give money to different organizations. But the, the next books that we're writing right now is um, we're working with a group called Project Chimp based out of here, based out of Atlanta, Georgia, about a, a baby chimp, about a chimp actually named Kareem. And he's about 36 years old, I believe. But he has won, undergone medical testing for years and years and years. And I'm not sure we're right on the age. i got to double check that. But he went from facility to facility where people, where he just went medical testing. And it was so tough. And so we're writing a book that is actually very hard to write. Um, and trying to show the good thing that's happening to them now. And so if you look at medical testing, you know, where does a chimp belong? A chimp belongs in the forest. It doesn't belong in a laboratory. It doesn't belong in a home and it doesn't in the big picture it doesn't belong in a sanctuary they need to be wild but they can't be now because they've been through all this so we have a book coming out that should be out in about about two months six weeks then we're also doing a book with um we're hoping with the whale sanctuary you know so if you hear this and you're in a whale sanctuary i hope that you'll do this with us um it's called Saving Scully. We're working with a producer named Phil Fairclaw, who has actually produced Saving Coven, The Loneliest Elephant with Cher. He's done um, Grizzly Man, a number of just amazing. He's an amazing um, film photographer, but I'm really fortunate to have him working with me um, to write this book about an orca that's been in captivity in the United States, and, and I think is still in captivity. But it's that's a story that we're writing right now. Um, and hopefully that's out within the next two months. Then Saving uh, Elephant Foundation, as I mentioned, will be doing a book with Lech Chilart. And the book is about Tong A, who was a, who was a street begging elephant in Thailand. And, um, you know, it's it's kind of a tough story. But, you know, I got to see the elephant. I was boots on the ground, got to see what they're doing. And um, I don't know, at the end of the day, maybe... Green Kids or Love the Wild Foundation will try and sponsor an elephant and try and get one saved. It does cost some money and um, it's just a great thing that you can do. We're looking at doing a book on a Yellowstone wolf. I've been up to Yellowstone and actually was there recently before the floods happened. In fact, I was there the day of the flood and just barely missed it. Um, but we're hoping to work with um, a Rick McIntyre who's done a series of books on wolves and if not someone else. Um, who's a wolf expert, but we're looking at doing a story about wolf number eight, an iconic wolf leader. And I just thought it would be great to, you know, round us out with a wolf. So I'm working on, on doing all my research on wolves and learning about them. And then a, a book on a turtle, we're working with a group called Turtles Fly Chew. And we may do a board book more for little kids. Um, but they actually fly planes all over the country, the U.S. mainly, and uh, the southern part of this, you know, down in Mexico and that area. And they save um, turtles that are actually beached and dying or it's too cold and they're just, and they move them hundreds and hundreds of turtles. So that book's going to be fun and I have to move that along. It's just, we've been very busy. And book on penguins, I'd love to tell you that, but I can't tell you who we're pretty close to. A major partnership with penguins and I never thought I'd be writing a penguin book but I probably will be um, maybe about the there's a endangered species African penguin and then we've talked about um, with a rainforest partnership you know um, relationship we have that maybe we can actually work on a specific book for rain for, for the rainforest group so so those are just some of the things we have on our plate we've been asked to work with the cheetah group right now um, you know, I mean, there's just so many species and animals and situations in this world. And I just hope at the end of it that we can actually teach people and children the importance of preserving our animals, our world, and just, you know, make sure that people know that 
this world can be has to be shared with animals. It's not just our world, and we seem to think that it all belongs to us. And I hope that our stories make a difference, and that you know the children who read these stories will become stewards of our world and our environment. Or if their parents have been someone who have done things that aren't so good, they teach your child, their parents not to do that. So that's my hope and my prayer. So that's kind of my presentation. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. We also have Ellie the Mindful Elephant animation. And um, that one's more about, you know, it's coming from Ellie the, you know, and the Shining Star book. And essentially what we're trying to do is we, we try to bring mindfulness and kindness into a baby elephant's life and all the animals that she's, all the other baby animals she lives with. And so right now we're hopefully getting, we'll get picked up by a broadcaster. So keep your eye out for that one. And um, anyways, that's my presentation. We thought this was be really cute. And um, this is actually out in a, a major rainforest area in Thailand. Actually, is it Thailand? Yep, it's Thailand. You can tell by these elephants and their, the shape of their, their bodies. And if you want to contact me, here's my information. Here I am with Molelo. And we can be contacted at www.greenkidsclub.com. This is our office number, and here's my personal email, uh, uh, email Sylvia, S-Y-L-V-I-A, greenkid at gmail.com. So I hope that this presentation is something that you will enjoy and learn from. And if you have a book or an idea that you'd like to talk to us about, we definitely would be happy to talk with you, or if you just want some guidance on how to do, to do something like this. So thank you very much, and we appreciate I appreciate your attention, and hopefully you have learned a lot about us.